Hi there. Um, this is Tab. Just very quick, are all three of my judges here in this round? Just trying to make sure. All right, cool. Thank you so much. Have a good round. <laughs> good luck. Um, is everyone here? Yeah, I think so. Okay, uh, I can send my email in chat if anyone wants to get an email chain. Uh, yeah, I guess I can make it. <clears throat> I'm gonna use the restroom. All right, I just sent out the email chain. Uh, let me know if everyone's got it. I got it. Uh, is everyone off side? Like to go? Oh, give me a sec. I think I'm like lagging. Okay. Ian, maybe try just disconnecting and reconnecting because you're frozen on my screen. Wait, you're cutting out. What'd you say? You're cutting out for me. Um, I don't know if the issue is on your end or my end, but I said disconnect and reconnect maybe. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's a little bit can choppy you, though. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's, it's kind of choppy. Is that for anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can hear y'all. I just, it's just like a little laggy. Yeah, Ian, try disconnecting and then reconnecting. Okay.
Can you hear me now? Perfect. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot better. Um, I'm ready. All right, yeah, I'm good too. Great. All the judges ready? All right. It'll be pretty slow, so I don't think there's very much you need for a doc. All right. So again, Newton South versus Neg. Time starts. Now, we need contention one is civil war, and subpoint A is resource extraction. Danny Ten writes that since World War II, colonial empires have relied on the IMF to ensure their continued access and control over raw materials. Today, this takes place with the IMF structural adjustment policies. Global Exchange 11 writes that unlike the path historically followed by industrialized countries, the IMF forces the Global South to prioritize exports over the development of diversified economies. The Global Exchange writes that this happens in three ways. First, IMF SAPs force shifts from production for local consumption to the production to have exports to destined for wealthy countries. Second, the IMF requires countries to eliminate assistance to domestic industries while providing benefits for multinational corporations. Assets such as forest land and water are sold to foreign investors at rock bottom prices. Third, IMF SAPs ensure debt repayment by devaluating national currencies to make exports cheaper. This increases resource extraction. In Sierra Leone, you mean 20 rights, IMF currency devaluation lowered the cost of Sierra Leone's minerals for other countries, incentivizing diamond extraction and a decreasing the amount of revenue the government could generate by selling diamonds. Empirically, row 18 writes that 88% of low-income countries became more dependent on extradives exports over the last 16 years. Resource dependence is catastrophic because resource extraction gains are concentrated in the hands of the corrupt elite and commodity prices often fluctuate. Sachs explains there's a negative correlation between a country's dependence on mineral exports and poverty, malnutrition, authoritarianism, and civil war. Bannon 03 corroborates a billion people live in countries that have been unable to sustain policies and institutions that would have allowed them to develop because of dependency on commodities. Close to 50 armed conflicts have strong links to resource exploitation. So point B is fostering unrest. Hartzell 10 writes that IMF-induced economic liberalization produces clear-cut winners and losers. For example, state employees saw their salaries cut 25% and taxes targeted citizens while multinational corporations were granted privileges. Losers might be motivated to engage in armed conflict. Moreover, Toussaint 20 writes that the IMF has flexibility towards right-wing governments facing strong left opposition. Chile, Brazil, and Nicaragua provide cases in point. The IMF doesn't hesitate to fund dictatorships. Overall, for these two reasons, GOIN 07 finds structural adjustment facility programs increase a country's risk of experiencing civil conflict by 102.8%. Not only do civil wars kill millions, but Sign 12 of Kentucky writes, civil wars cause floods of refugees, placing a heavy burden on a state's ability to provide public services and spreading infectious diseases. And civil wars disru severely disrupt neighboring economies due to disrupted trade flows and decreases in FDI. Contention two is epistemic economics. Before the peak of the IMF, the world was transitioning towards social democracies. Iber 18 explains, for most of the 20th century, neoliberals were losing. The world was going in a social democratic direction. European countries built up welfare states and the global south the managed consideration of their economic needs. The IMF interrupted that transition. Mueller 11 writes the fund legitimized neoliberalism through its role as an authoritative scholar, research surveillance, advising states, and being a key player in transnational society. Even today, BWP 19 writes that the IMF continues to be amongst the most powerful norm setters of international development. Mueller concludes that neoliberalism became firmly entrenched in the 1990s. This ideology was supported through the IMF with greater leverage than other international organizations because the resources it had to outstrip its critics. The rise of neoliberalism destroyed sustainable development for the global poor. Cutner 19 writes, neoliberal regimes promoted rules created by private capital to keep democratic governments from asserting rules of fair competition or countervailing social interests. Absent this neoliberal takeover, social democracies would have created a better world. As Sandbrook 07 writes, social democracies provide an antidote to the destructive tendencies of neoliberalism through progressive taxation, labor market regulation, and welfare provision. Sandbrook concludes income growth in developing countries was 2.5% per year under social democracies compared to 0% under neoliberalism. The development of social capitalism in the 60s and 70s is superior on all measures to the neoliberal 80s and 90s. Overall, Garcia 11 concludes poverty in the global south was caused by the West. Trainer 19 terminalizes conventional deployment theories and are morally uh, development theories are morally unacceptable and it could then billions of people to suffer extreme poverty for generations. Thus, we negate. Well, can I see the 2.5% growth, 0% growth, neoliberal versus social democracy? Yes. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, unless Ian wants anything, I think I should be good.
Yes, sir. Uh, I'll start case as soon as I see in my inbox. There we go, I think I got it. Okay, everyone hear me okay? Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, perfect. Um, just making sure, I, I have like a little notice that says my Wi-Fi is bad, everyone can you hear me good? All good. All right, I'm just gonna assume Zoom's being silly. Um, all right, if everyone's good, I'm gonna begin time. Now, we affirm and contention one is Jordan. Despite the combination of a global financial crisis, energy crisis, and the Arab Springs, Jordan's economy has remained resilient. Trading Economics 20 finds that GDP annual growth rate in Jordan averaged 4.1% from 1993 until 2020, reaching an all-time high of 10.6%. The IMF reform to Jordan has facilitated social spending support and programs that balance budgets. Well, lead 19 explains that Jordan has adopted various programs in cooperation with the IMF from, 18, 19, from 1989 to 2019 under several standby agreements. This has directly lifted 260,000 people out of poverty. Burns 05 contextualizes that the share of the population living in extreme poverty declined from 6.6% to 4%, reflecting the better targeting of social safety nets of support. Contention two is social stability. The IMF has created stability in two ways. The first is through tax reform. Escobar 18 explains that the IMF has strengthened government finances and will generate funds for a rural development program estimated to cost $42 billion. Without this tax reform, it would have been impossible to make the peace agreement with the FARC rebels in Colombia, a place of refuge that killed 200,000 people and displaced another 6 million. The second way is through stabilization loans. The IMF alleviates tensions between governments and local ethnic groups. So 15 explains that stabilization loans allow governments to buy off opposition from ethnic groups who might be encouraged to mobilize. These loans are the most effective when they come from the IMF. So it further is that IMF involvement cuts the level of ethnic tension in a country by half. Minority groups are likely to welcome a potentially neutral actor for devising reforms because they would have better guarantees against being economically discriminated against by the ruling ethnic elite. Indeed, Nelson 11 further is that going to the IMF implies the surrender of economic management to an external authority. In order to compensate for this cost, leaders seek to expand their base of support through selective spending increases and spending cuts on the military. Crucially, Danny 14 finds that since 1946, 64% of all civil wars have divided along ethnic lines. The desire of an ethnic group to gain political independence from the state makes ethnicity an inevitable feature of conflict. Besides millions dying in each conflict, Stanford 16 writes that civil wars lead to state fragmentation, an enormous amount of civilian casualties, which generates large-scale refugee flows and great powers in proxy wars, exacerbating conflict. Contention three is economic recovery. Julie 21 writes in mid-March that the developing world is currently facing twin crises, a balance of payments and debt crises that upend developmental progress. COVID-19 created liquidity shortages and sharp hikes in global capital markets. Williams 20 finds that as many as 90 million people could be plunged beneath into extreme economic poverty. Fortunately, the IMF is spearheading recovery in two ways. The first is by increasing credit worthiness. Broom 08 explains that less developed frontier economies seek to draw on the credibility of the IMF's institutional reputation for demanding tough policy conditions and macroeconomic restraint as a way to signal to international audiences that they are a safe investment. The IMF has empirically increased sovereign credit ratings, as Lang 18 finds that out of 117 statements from rating agencies that mention the IMF, 84 indicate a positive influence of an active IMF program on their assessment, while only one mentions a negative influence. Increasing credit worthiness increases investment and makes it cheaper to borrow money by decreasing interest rates on the debt. Thus, OECD 2000 finds that poverty rates declined by an average of 20% under IMF-supported programs. The second way is by resolving liquidity shortages. Gabor 21 explains that special drawing rights or SDRs are an esoteric international token system used by the IMF to, to provide influxes of cash to developing nations. These help the lenders settle international debts and imbalances between countries. In February, the IMF was given approval to allocate $500 billion in new rights to help ease recovery in poorer nations. Collins 20 finds that an SDR allocation can be implemented quickly and is less skewed in the direction of large wealthy countries. Low income nations could boost their international reserves by 20% or more. By trading in these reserves for cash, Liao 21 finds that this additional financing source would give low-income nations more flexibilities to purchasing vaccines or restructuring their economy. For example, so Rural 20 finds that the IMF's SDR allocations would give the Ethiopian government enough money to increase its health spending by 45%. 
may intend to quantity contextualize this. And major financial constraints will translate to millions of unnecessary debts and a major increase in poverty levels. A large issuance of SDRs is an easy and effective way to provide a major infusion of financial support to the countries that most need it, and thus reaffirm. Uh, quickly before cross, um, can I see any evidence that indicates a holistic decrease in ethnic tensions on the sub BC2? And uh, just a clarification, I can take flex for this if you want. The warrant, the Lang evidence is credit worthiness increases FDI. Uh, give me one second. Let me just put it. Okay. Uh, what's the question on Lang? Lang says that credit worthiness increases FDI, which decreases poverty. Uh, not necessarily FDI, it just. Um better credit which allows for i see lang then so, yeah. i see lang and oecd and then, so be, thank yeah. you Wait, what's the last thing you wanted you said uh, lang and then oecd which is the thing i struck with love it oecd like the poverty one yeah the one directly below lang okay oh yeah, yeah, yeah. okay i got you and then once we get it we're good for growth yep i'm just adding the oecd one All right, cool. Um, this is the right email chain, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, I sent all whatever number that was. Let me know when you get it, we can do cross. And you can have the first question since you spoke first. Great, I'll tell you when I get it. Yep, got it, let's do it. All right, so time will start my first word. Sure. Does the, are credit weight ratings that are changed by the IMF are those based in material changes in their economic policy, or are they just the IMF's influence increasing credit ratings? Uh, it can happen either way. I think if there's material changes in a country's economy, that is more likely to cause credit ratings to go up, but it's also a perceptual thing, right? Investors are more likely to invest, loan money, have lower interest rates, et cetera, if they believe that the country is fundamentally sound and the IMF gives that impression. Can I have a question? Um, on your just first contention in general, right? So your links on resource extraction about like SAPs, like no like domestic assistance, debt repayment, and your sure. subpoint B about unrest, those all fundamentally rely on the existence of SAPs, right? Um, I'm. Because you say SAPs in every single warrant, I just want to make so, sure. So for for the resource extraction ones, it's mostly yeah, it's all SAPs. But it's also currency so devaluation B, on the th on the third one. On but that's a so product of SAPs, isn't it? No, currency devaluation is a separate economic policy. Why does currency IMF? devaluation happen? Because the IMF has control of global exchange rates, so they can devaluate currencies on will. On sub point B, um, we would say it's also probably a function of currency devaluation as well. But also, like more than that, any support to right wing governments, even if that's loans and that don't have SAPs, is probably also triggering the link. Okay, that's cool. Lots you of questions. Question. Yeah. So. Let's talk about your evidence. How do you quantify ethnic tensions? Um, it's actually really funny, like the way they do it. Um, it just talks about like the, they use, I believe like a UNICEF data, like World Bank data set in order to uh, like estimate the probability of conflict in certain levels based what's on like, the, what's the data set levels. about ethnic, like what's the data set that it's, can it's about it's about tensions? like the probability of conflict and like the like willingness of these like organizations groups whatever to go to conflict in comparison to when they have IMF intervention and when so they don't do you have any evidence about the actual probability of conflict that's what Soisa the study talks about it's just, it's just saying tensions like can you tell me how much that increases conflict yeah, yeah so no so the um yeah, so when the tensions are lower, that decreases the probability of conflict. I, no, can give I, I get that. Do you have any that probability of conflict? I don't think that's even possible. But the fact that empirically it's true by the source of evidence, I think it's enough justification. Can I have a question? Sure. Yeah, on your C2 about epistemic economics, this yeah. argument is pretty interesting, right? You talk about how, like, Very interesting. is your goal, is the argument that had it not been for neoliberalism, like the entire world would have become social democracies. Yes. So how, okay, so social democracies are fundamentally capitalistic, right? So yes. let's say like Norway, for example, is a great example of a social democracy. It's a great example. They make, so they do things like tax corporations in order mm -hmm. to you know, provide a better quality of life. What do the corporations do as a response to them being taxed in their own countries? I mean, you're going to say they flee, but they're not going to flee. No, 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 they don't, they don't flee. They go into the developing world and exploit even more, don't they? Because they have to make up for the lost money. No, so he, here's so how problem. can an entire so world become here's, so Here's the problem with, with this response you're making in Rebel, which is that we tell you there's a worldwide economic shift towards social democracy absent you having this new uprising of neoliberalism. You can't shift towards 
undeveloped countries that don't have like good policies if every country has made good social democratic policies. But that's gross. Okay, um, sure. Sorry, I think you sent me the wrong evidence. I don't need the IMF loans to increase credit ratings. I rather need that credit, why the internal warning for why credit ratings are good. All right, credit worthiness is good. Um, yeah, we just say increasing credit worthiness makes it cheaper to borrow money by decreasing interest rates on the debt. Uh, do you want me to give you broom? Maybe yeah. that's what you want. Yeah, maybe that's what I need. Right. Debt being bad. No, it's not debt being bad. I have, in, I have increases in investment. And I want to know what evidence that is. Okay, we, uh, yeah, I can pull it up. Oh, Ian, you got it? Okay, perfect. It's actually fine. Um, am I good? Oh, I just sent it. Okay. Uh, I'll take a peek. We'll take breath, we just got it. Stop, bro. He's just getting a dog ready. He'll be speaking in a second. Okay. So that was 20 seconds. I'm going to send this in case this is too fast for anyone, though I doubt it will be. And the order is going to be top 10. Ready? Oh, wait, can you give me a second? I'm trying to open Absolutely. Yeah, go for it. Zoom is not like copy. One second. Oh, there we go. I'm good. Right, perfect. Can you give me a second as well? Yeah, I got you. Okay, I'm good. Okay. Is everyone, did anyone say they're not good? Okay. I'm going to assume that everyone's good. On to one about Jordan. One, the AFP 18 right Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Kuwait offered a $2.5 billion in aid for Jordan to ease the economic crisis. Two implications to aid the loans. The real solvency for Jordan is AFP continues that Jordan was struggling to curb its debt after securing loans from the AFP. It turns cases the IMF to more Jordan, a Jordanian on unrest. The AFP concludes austerity measure tied to the loan of seen prices of basic cities rise across the kingdom, accumulating in a week of angry protests. Second, he linked Jordan is still on the brink. Young this week writes Jordan remains burdened, on public de- burdened by public debt obligations to 85% of GDP needs fresh external financing. So obviously their loans didn't solve. On to C2, but economic flexibility on subpoint A, but tax rates in Colombia, one, their evidence is horrible. It's literally all from the IMF, which is bad because A is literally the most biased source on the topic, and B, it suggests they couldn't find any other evidence with this claim, which it just simply isn't true. Second, their Escobar evidence is that civil war has already lasted five decades, and there has been no great power conflict. The death toll is 4,000 people a year. Every other argument out ways. And third, turn it. Tucker 20 finds that since the agreement was signed, thanks to God, worse to a, to a lack of protection. Gooley 20 finds that the deal created a power vacuum for all the violent groups to emerge, making it different, difficult for humanitarian groups to intervene. A groups used, used to negotiate with parliamentary groups, but the new groups won't. FAQ 19 terminalizes that in Colombia, 4.5 million people are now severely, severely food insecure at weighing on magnitude. On sub point two. B, about stabilization and ethnic conflict. One, turn it. Toussaint indicates that the IMF created the Rwandan genocide in two ways. A, to value the currency of Rwanda and the military used it to sell goods on the black market at a higher value to fund themselves. But B, IMF staff played, laid off thousands of government workers who got angry at the government and turned to the turned, turned to the genocide. BCC concludes that the genocide was killed 800,000 people. Second, turn it. IMF loans to future oppression. Four warrants. A, government crackdown. Brown 09 writes, democratic practice is declined in the presence of conditionality as the government reduces civil liberties in an attempt to quell social unrest that results in structural adjustment. B, 
increased authoritarianism. RMI 14 right steps erode the traditional role of the state through deregulation and privatization, consequently eroding their capacity to govern these conditions, encourage countries to restore oppressive measures in order to ensure implementation of reform. C perception. I am affluent to make governments perceptually wary is key. 14 warrants that government's perception of domestic threats increase, which in turn increases the probability that states repression of domestic dissent. Fourth, corruption. A D corruption. Mercury G08 rights governments use funds from Britain Woods institutions to buy up political opposition rather than invest it in promoting economic development. The IMF provides no incentive to monitor if loans flows are being effectively utilized for recipient nations. Ross 05 concludes because repression breeds and set the probability of civil war on the increase by a factor of almost 16 the highly oppressive countries, which link turns their case and always in scope. Because Nichols 18 finds that civil wars are often against minority groups, which is why aid and agenda that the civil conflict and ethnic conflicts are in civil wars. On to two with the economic recovery on their third link on their first link about credit ratings. One, it's not unique, is fixed 21 rights are rising commodity prices, capital flows, and, and capital inflows, and weaker US dollars add up to a more favorable credit environment for emerging markets in 2021. Second, turn of the IMF puts its irresponsible policies which have bad credit. IMF failed to trigger defaults as Whalen rights. IMF will create irresponsible and destructive economic policies by removing the incentive for investors to please governments. Health for 98 concludes IMF moral hazard has played a role in a hundred bank crisis. But third, their evidence is literally from the IMF. It's horrible, and you don't evaluate it because their impact terminalization is from the IMF. I'm taking a look about SDRs. Five responses. One, if you link it, SDRs are not enough. Jacobs wrote last week that SDRs are delivered to proportion to economic size. So the SDR increase only delivered $21 billion in reserves to low income countries. That's too little. Gregory 21 writes low income countries need $550 billion to recover. Second, if you look at countries won't spend SDRs because they need them for IMF memberships. The IMF 21 explains a member always only pays, must pay its IMF membership subscription. 25% must be paid in SDRs. And here it's proof. Only 2% of SDRs were spent in 08 and lauder 20 members. At this time, the percentage looked to be small as well. Third, non unique alternatives would exist. It's Kapoor 06 with the Asian development. Bank is planning on creating a similar reserve asset to use in their own development lead lending. So absent the IMF, the ADB would have filled in. Fourth, turn it. 84% of IMF loans have exterities. Rutherford 20, which is 60, 76 of the 91 IMF loans push for belt tightening that can result in deep cuts to public health care systems and social protections. Austerity hurts the countries that hate claims to help. Pete 09 concludes 5 million children die yearly because of austerity, which always their case on severity because it impacts the death and also on time period because it's an infinite impact. Their arguments with one economic recession. But fourth, fifth, and finally, turn it. SDRs below corruption is the Hill 21 rights. There are no strings to Attached to how government uses SDRs, country may want recipient states to focus on acquiring vaccines like, but they surrender accountability for how much how the money is used, inviting waste and corruption, which empirically only two percent of SDRs were cash in 08. This argument's ahistoric. Uh, can I just see the evidence on the four warrants about civil wars? That's it. Absolutely. Oh, I wanted to see one more thing. Um, can I see the power vacuum stuff on tax reform? Um, oh, yeah. and need yeah. SDRs for IMF membership. Yes, I can send everything but power vacuum stuff and Theo will send power. All right, sounds good. Uh, we'll run prep once we get it. Power vacuum stuff is sent. Um, Jasper sent everything else. All right, I'll like stay unmuted, you know, so like you know I'm not prepping or something. What was the last card so beside the four ones. reasons and four power vacuum? Sent. Yeah, four four ones about to be sent. What's the last card? The IMF membership stuff on SRS. No, actually, I don't think I need the two percent stuff. Is everything else sent though? Oh, two percent isn't. I mean, not two percent. It's it's everything sent anyway. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I didn't mean two percent. I meant the one before it, yeah. which is the membership. But uh, yeah, we'll, I think we're good. We'll oh, okay, we're taking breath. Um, I'll put my hand up at the timer and stuff when I'm in the call with him.
that was 12 seconds. Um, the order is going to start by frontlining our case and then um, going to their case. Um, is everyone good? Okay. We'll concede that Jordan's struggling to get IMF loans and they're still on the brink, which means that their turn doesn't matter. On tax reform, we'll concede that there's been no great power conflicts, which means that there's no impact off the turn. On the Rwanda, they say that uh, they're on the Rwanda turn, there are other reasons why conflict has started and persisted in Rwanda, such as ethnic tensions and geopolitical instability, which means that they cannot prove that there, there would have been no conflict absent the IMF, so they have no impact. They give four turns as why the IMF like increases perception, authoritarianism, government crackdowns, group it. They've conceded the Nelson evidence, which indicates to compensate for loss of economic control. Uh, countries choose to increase social spending and cut the military, which means that they're not becoming more authoritarian, rather becoming more democratic. This is a conceded piece of evidence. Number two, they've also conceded the SOSA evidence, which indicates that these countries are more likely to get reform from a new actor, which is the IMF, which is why they've conceded that the IMF historically decreases ethnic tensions by one half. Go to our third contention. They say that uh, there's been a rise in commodity prices, so there's been an increase in credit. They've conceded duly, which indicates that we're still in a crisis right now, we're right now which means that it's not working. Then they say that the IMF promotes irresponsible policy. Number one, the IMF is providing technical assistance to many of these countries right now. But number two, they lend from many other agencies asking the IMF, so it's non-unique. But, but number three, we'd also say that these countries expect to pay the IMF back in full, so there's no irresponsible policy. But they, they, they had to pay all this money back to the IMF. On the SDR's argument, they say it's not, not, not enough, but A, they've conceded that it's enough to increase reserves in developing countries by 20%, and B, these uh, higher income countries are now donating their SDRs to lower income countries. Then they say that they won't spend this money, A, but they won't spend this money, but they've conceded that A, empirically it's increased healthcare spending by 45% and empirically it's mitigated the OA crisis, which is that empirically it's working. Then they say there's other alternatives, but we say one, that we're in a crisis right now, which means that the alternatives probably aren't working, but B, the IMF, the, the IMF SDRs have uniquely allocated $500 billion, so the IMF is unique. Then they say that 84% of COVID loans have austerity. One, the IMF is prioritizing social spending right now, but two, these SDRs are unconditional. There are no austerity for any of these SDR loans. Um, then they say that corruption happens, but one, the IMF provides technical assistance to these countries, so there's no corruption in the long term, but two, even if there's some sort of corruption, they've conceded that empirically it's worked in 08 and has increased healthcare spending by 45%. Let's go to their case. Um, on resource extraction, one of the reasons why countries even go to IMF in the first place is because they don't have successful diversified economies, which means that resource extraction would have happened either way, and there's no trend of diversification without the IMF. Second of all, Downey explains that there's other organizations such as the World Bank and the WTO, which is forced resource extraction. The third, Downey also finds that countries would adopt natural resource extraction in both worlds because for private profit and to pay off debt. On their argument about fostering unrest, First, all their evidence doesn't account for selection biases. Countries that experienced civil wars were already going undergoing political instability. Second, Mirko Durkin finds that there's no correlation between the IMF and civil wars because the IMF promotes good government and structural adjustment ends up benefiting countries in the long run. But third, turning to the IMF forces autocrats to surrender economic authority to an external authority, undermining the capacity of authoritarian governments to retain power, which is why Nelson finds that empirically the IMF increases democracy by 4.29%. Fourth, Nelson Levin also finds that when the IMF takes away control of economic management for countries, they compensate by increasing loss of control by increasing selective spending while cutting the military so they're not becoming more authoritarian, but they're becoming more democratic. On their C2, first, new colonial forces exist in everything like military intervention in the UN evaluate the round based on the benefits that low income people garner. Second of all, the IMF is the lender of last result, meaning that it isn't the IMF imposing themselves on countries, rather these countries coming to the IMF. But third of all, the IMF has radically reformed its policy with more voting power. Kisak 16 finds that 6% of votes from, from overrepresented countries have been re reallocated to emerging economies, so it's not becoming neo-imperialist and, and, and it's reforming right now. But fourth, social democracies are just disguises, uh, disguised continuations of colonialism. Social democracies such as the Nordic countries in Europe increase quality of life for their own citizens by taxing large corporations because money is essentially zero. Some social democracies force these companies to increase exploitation in the developing world to make up this lost profit. For this reason, social democracies fundamentally cannot exist in the developing world because they require power and balance between the global north and the south. Fifth of all, we see that economic growth links in because A, creates more independent stability, and B, structural economic benefits means that such policies aren't harmful. The IMF promotes economic growth because A, it frees up debt and capital for a country, which is why debt is 90% lower. So on net, Johnson finds that spending is five times higher after IMF initiatives, but B, the IMF is providing policy advice and assessing the macroeconomic aspects of scaling up public investment, and Louder finds that this infrastructure investment can create 33 million jobs and increase GDP by 2.7%. Okay, give for cross. You want to take that up to you? No. Uh, I want to call for some stuff. Let me. Uh, yeah. you want to take over stuff. My bad. Can you just send me the text of the last two arguments you read? Uh, sure. It's I can see it during cross. It's fine. Just like I just want to send it to you. Uh, do you want the cards? Uh sure. Actually, nah, it's probably fine. Okay. 
Okay. Never cross. Okay, give me a sec. I'm sending them. Okay. Okay, I sent them. Okay. Ask okay. Are you good now? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Cool. To clarify, your sub B about stabilization loans is about civil conflict, right? Um, it's about like ethnic tensions. Yeah, but it's, it's like, but that's a but that's like yeah. a, a specific kind of civil conflict, right? Uh, can right. I? Have a yeah, it is though, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Okay, so when you read evidence in our case, there's no correlation. Does that kick us out of our case and your sub B? The argument is that the, there's no correlation between the IMF causing civil wars because it. Yeah, you say war. you say that the negatives offset the positive. So does everything is offset? I said that one countries that experienced civil wars were already going in, under instability, and two, the IMF promotes good government. No, your Midgard evidence, which you read, says it's because it increases democracy, which offsets the bad stuff. So does this not wash out all the civil war flow? Like, I'm cool no. with that. No, no, our evidence indicates that the IMF promotes good government, so there's no link between the IMF causing civil wars. I never said that takes out our second argument. Well, it does though, right? Because it's a kind of civil war, and you say that there's no increase or decrease in civil war per your Medigard evidence, which you've also read. Okay. Right? So no one's going for civil war then? Yeah. Okay, you can have a question. Okay, um, so on your Fitch evidence, how much has credit increased due to a rise in commodity prices in the week? Enough that credit worthiness is no longer necessary. I have a question. You haven't said that. What? Yeah, I think so. How come the developing world is still in a balance of payment crisis? Because they're in a recession. It's getting better. Growth is they're upward. We're, we're making upward trend arguments. Not that the not that the currently the brick is good, but rather that the brick will get better. How much has it gone up? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I I don't study developing world credit ratings all that much. But uh, so if you know, you can tell me. Was it enough if we're still in a crisis and you can't? By how much because we're up. getting out of the crisis we're, we're, our arguments is status quo is solving but you can see the uniqueness indicating that as of this month we're still in a balance of payments crisis all right but it's getting better hence our argument can I ask a question it's indicating it's better you just read i'm on the doc it says fitch explains that due to a weaker us dollar there's an increase in credit you read no evidence indicating that it's getting better you just say there's a more favorable credit. You do not have a terminal impact on this argument. So where do you read evidence indicating? Where do you read evidence indicating? I don't. It's an analytic. You don't have a terminal impact on this argument, so I'm not 100% concerned. Can I? Uh, let's talk about this first response read on epistemics. You say that neocolonial structures exist regardless. Why is this responsive? I just don't understand what this means. Oh, the argument's just that like you should prioritize the benefits of low control because there's always going to be neocolonial forces. For example, military intervention, uh, the UN, for example. Okay, but if we prove that neo, if we prove that neoliberalism led to all poverty globally, that probably links to that, right? Our argument is that we should evaluate based on the effects on poverty. Yeah. Okay. Cool. You can have a question. Um, that's time. I don't think so. Yeah, I've. I've how's, oh, okay. Apparently that's not. All right. How was your day? Good. My, me too. All right, we're on prep. Stop prep. Can you use just repeat the three front lines of the moral hazard? The DA and your so C's three link one. Yeah, the front lines were um the IMF provides technical assistance. It. Two, it's not unique because they lend to many other institutions. And three, um, these countries expect to pay the IMF back in full, which is why moral hazard only happens five percent of the time. Okay.
Uh, it's 210 use total. Great. So it's going to start on your case. Um, yeah. It's going to start your case, it's going to start on stability. And then it's going to go on to some stuff on COVID recovery and then on liquidity. Time starts. Now, on a second tension, they've agreed that they can wash out all this offense as far as their hearts often finds that they, all of the pros and cons will be ready to balance out on their second and the third contention is what they're going for. A couple of responses. On the first warrant, we are going for our moral hazard turn. We tell you our, for our wayland evidence, you have moral hazard because countries make bad economic policy when they know it can be bailed out by the damage, which is why it is empirically caused a hundred banking crises. They give you three responses when they say it's increased technical assistance, but it doesn't stop the technical assistance, it doesn't stop them making bad policies before they get technical assistance. They say that it gives them, uh, that the other countries give them access to credit, but they're not the lender of last resort. It's literally all of their rhetoric throughout this round. Finally, they tell you that they're going to have to pay them back in full, but one, it's more in the long term, and two, they still know they're getting bailed out by the IMF absent, even if they have bad policy, which is why empirically it's called 100 banking crisis, which means we tell you they're only solving back for a problem they've caused, and it's probably the best link to credit ratings insofar as they have substantial reason instead of a recessional one. Then on liquidity, they've pretty much conceded the austerity turn. We tell you that 84% of the loans in the status quo are coming with austerity and deep cuts to social spending, which is why our read at Pre evidence finds 5 million children have been dying because it's cutting social spending from beneath their ground, beneath their feet. They give you two responses. One, they say it's not in the status quo. Yes, in the status quo, 84% of the loans are bad. Then they say that they, like, but we tell you this guy with their argument for three reasons. One, it's on time frame. They're arguing they a one time injection per their argument at SDRs. We tell you our argument goes infinitely to the future, which means it magnifies. Secondly, Oxfam finds that all of the problems with poverty in the developing world in the status quo are caused by a lack lack of safety nets because of IMF cuts. We tell you, insofar as you solve back for that, it doesn't matter. You don't need an SDR allocation for the safety nets that already exist. And finally, we tell you, we have a magnitude as far as death is irreversible and 6 million children have died specifically because of IMF policies. Obviously a really, really easy way to vote for us off the bat. With that said, also on SDRs, we tell you it's not really a very big argument as far as only 2% of them get cash. They say it helps the developing world. They're just trying to trump up $600 billion. Only 2% is actually getting cash. That happened empirically. They tried to say empirics, but that's what happened in 08. Let's go to our case. We're not going to go for civil war on epistemics. They pretty much just tried to respond to the neoliberalism that's good on the flow. One, they say that everything is neocolonialism. Uh, one, it's not neocolonialism. On the second response, they say the IMF is the lender of last resort. But Mueller evidence finds that's only for lending. But when you think about the economic theory, the IMF is the only one that's doing research surveillance and giving advice. It is the key to the mindset. They say there's been reforms, but not away from neoliberalism as the central tenet of IMF of the IMF. They say that it's created uh, that it's bad to have social democracies because it creates forced exploitation. One, our Sandberg evidence is looking at developing countries and finding one, they have better increases in income, but also independently, there's six year higher uh, higher left expectancy in developing countries who had the same kind of social democratic practices, obviously not a problem there. But secondly, only because of neoliberalism is this true, only because the developed South is neoliberal, can, uh, undeveloped South is neoliberal, can they afford to send companies there? If everyone had the correct mindset and the correct policies, no one could be exploiting resources, or exploiting people. They give you a bunch of DAs at the bottom. They want to say there's an increasing growth, but our austerity thing is more terminalized as far as 84% of the loans come of austerity and our evidence isn't from the INF. Also, it doesn't really change our argument of the mindset even if they're getting good loans on policy advice, it doesn't matter if they're giving policy advice or just it's not very for sure. With that said, you can send our argument. Our IBRA evidence finds will be rising the IMF, the world is going towards a social democratic direction, but our Mueller evidence finds that you switch this through surveillance and it's changing their mindset through creating a new economic theory, which is why our Sandberg evidence finds you get every metric of growth better, which we tell you is an alternate, uh, it gets solved back for all their cases. If you get a better metric of growth, one, it wouldn't matter if there are people in poverty, uh, people would have a higher income than the size of but two, we tell you our training evidence finds you wouldn't have billions of people in poverty that you have to solve back for with the argument about economics. Okay, I didn't get the front line to the infrastructure turn. Like, I just didn't get what you said. Um, policy advice doesn't mean that there's actual infrastructure. Okay. Okay, uh, we'll take prep. Wait, really quickly. Um, for the last response on econ growth links in, you just read the 84% austerity, right? That's it? Yeah. We said it was more contextualized. contextualized. Okay, that's fine. I was making sure I didn't miss something. Um, I'll put my hand up to the timer stuff from your prep.
Okay, that was 233. So we uh, We used 10 before, so 17. I think I can do math. Okay. <clears throat> okay, it's gonna start on our case. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do their case and then the wing at the end. Um, okay. <clears throat> Is anyone not ready? Let me just get some water. Um, okay, is anyone not ready? We good? Okay. Starting time. Now, starting our case under C3, but economic recovery, on our first one, I'm gonna deal with the moral hazard trend. They say there's gonna be all these moral hazard irresponsible policies. First, we explain that there's more technical assistance from the IMF, which solves. They say it doesn't stop before, but our argument is literally that there's gonna be even more than 100 crises if there's no technical assistance because economic policy happens no matter what. The IMF provides technical assistance to prevent future crises and the crises in addition, which means we can co-op all their way. The next thing, that's, next thing we tell you is that other agencies also lend money. They say it's not the lender of last resort, but insofar as there's so many institutions like countries and institutions like the World Bank that actually loans money, that means that this um, like moral hazard is inevitable to some degree. They, uh, we also tell you that because people, these countries expect to pay back this money, moral hazard only happens 5% of the time. They see it's more in the long term. Insofar as they can see the evidence that says that it only happens 5% of the time, they weighing literally cannot exist insofar as it's like severe mitigation of the link. There's also the two other front lines. Let's go to our second one about liquidity. The argument is very simple. I'm going to send it first. We definitely get more evidence that SDRs are an influx of cash, a token that are given to developing countries during times of crisis, and it's worth $500 billion, which the Collins evidence says can increase the reserves by 20%. The Loire evidence tells you that we can do things like restructure economies, buy vaccines, which increase the social spending or health spending by 45% saves millions of lives and lifts us out of the COVID recession is the single best way to get out of the COVID recession. They extend two basic things. The first thing they tell you is that 84% of loans, um, have austerity. There's a couple of problems here. First, it doesn't respond to the links, so we still have link uh, as the link. And second, the data set of their own evidence, what Ian explains, is that it actually concludes that spending is increasing on net, which is why on their case, they can see two pieces of evidence. First is the Johnson evidence that tells you that social spending after the IMF is there is five times higher. That's conceded. But also the Gehring evidence tells you that there's, uh, when you account for selection bias, these countries would have lost all the social spending anyway. When you account for selection bias, we actually see that IMF spending is actually a lot higher. The next thing they try to tell you is that um, they send this defense that says that, like only 2% of like reserves are actually cash in at the end of the day. They can see the problem that it worked in 2008. Insofar as it worked in 2008, even if it's just 2%, it's actually still enough to solve the crisis. But also, we we're telling you that it's going to be even higher during COVID because the rich countries are doing things like donating their SDRs, and COVID is a much more like worse situation. So they have more of an incentive to actually cash in their SDRs. Also, the increase in spending by 45%, that's enough to access our impact. I think that's all good in our case. We uh, All they're weighing, we can co-op because we say that social spending increases insofar as you can see the evidence that social spending is five and higher. We access all their time frame, magnitude, all that stuff of, uh, all, all that kind of weighing. Let's go to their case. They go, they go for their C2 about epistemic economics, but the problem is his link extension is like, 12 seconds over time. He doesn't extend the link until after time ends. I don't think you should evaluate it. He doesn't have options at the end of the day. He thinks we're going to be going for is this economic growth link on the very bottom, which he completely mishandles. We tell you that economic growth links in because A, there's more independent stability, and then B, economic there's more economic benefits than harmful. For example, the cost of what Evans tells you that they're able to decrease that by 90%. And Johnson Evans tells you they're able to increase social spending by five times. And we also extend the water Evans that says that IMF policy advice is able to increase 33 million jobs and 2.7% of GDP. The one response he gives you on the first link in is that 84% of these COVID cuts have austerity. I already find that on our case saying that spending increases and they can see Johnson and Gehring for selection bias. He also responds to like the IMF policy advice turn by saying that like, I don't even know, he says like policy advice doesn't matter insofar as these issues occur. Um, we just tell you that there's going to be even more debt crises if there's more policy advice. It's the same thing on our case, which means that he doesn't have offense link sessions. The stuff on their case is dealt with is very easy to vote for us. Let us do cross. Yeah, I'm going for Carlos to get the first question. Oh, all right. <clears throat> My summary was three minutes and five seconds. Are you telling me all of the... <laughs> no, all of, yeah, yeah, no you started the Linky session at three minutes. Um, no, in the I didn't do that. that. No. You dude. also were five seconds over time. Well, so, even. No, no. So, wait, so, the only dude, thing, okay, don't, you, you know, don't, honestly, dude, don't, like, don't try to beat me by like lying so, about how long I had in my deal, time. Deal, like, deal, deal, deal. Have a real technical deal. Rest. You can, you can um, cut everything I said over four seconds over time. It's very easy to vote for us. Like that, that's fine. Like I don't need that rhetoric. You, you can started cut everything the session after time. time dude, you, you don't have to like misrepresent. No, what time I'm, I'm not trying to misrepresent. I, you literally didn't extend the link independent of that because you like fundamentally mishandled like the econ growth link in either way. I don't think it matters at the end of the day. But, I, I like, don't think I mishandled the economic growth link ins. In my days. opinion, you did. 
So, so they're, no, no, they're not DAs. They're Lincolns to your uh, epistemic economic okay. stuff. What is the warrant you give in summary as to why they link in? Because I hear zero. I just, I literally extended exactly what Ian said. He said that the best way to solve for things like neocolonialism is economic growth because it provides more independent stability. I'm like reading off my flow, by so the way. Why, so why are you responding? Benefit. Why why do you continue to respond to neocolonialism? Uh, so not, not just neo, just, just, just having idea. neo in the name doesn't make it the same point. No, it's just, it's just your fundamental argument about how- So like, how can economic growth, how, how does economic growth solve back from the, on, the idea of the problem with neoliberalism is that when you have economic growth, it only goes to the rich and to companies, which is why you don't have income growth on median. Like, no, how does economic growth solve back for the entire problem with neoliberalism? So the what we explained, which again isn't responded to, and Ian's rebuttal, the only thing we said is eighty four percent austerity. I said it was a DA. Wait, let, me, let, me finish, let me finish. Let me Okay, that's fine. If it's a DA, it still doesn't respond to that. Link, if right? it's a DA, it's outweighed. No. What? Here, yeah. let, let me explain. If or it's maybe, a DA, you're you read, losing weight. Let me, no, 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 let me explain. You read a DA about 80% of COVID loans in our case. We read a link turn on your case, and you just cross applied your DA when it doesn't answer the I link. also told you your evidence is from the IMF, because it is. That, it's obviously a selection bias. A, no, no. First of all, that IMF is... Your, your Johnson evidence is both hyper-specific and from the IMF. Like, how are you trusting that more than the fact that everyone has gone austerity and 6 million children have died because of the IMF? If 6 million children have died, don't you think someone has taken no, away their no. money? Johnson talked from the IMF. Yeah, so first of all, yeah, as that right. evidence, okay, to pop, there's, there's like a whole multitude of problems here. First, like none of that is implicated to that Johnson evidence. Like literally, it's I asked I asked this to make sure because I was like, did he really mess this up that badly? I asked, is the only thing you said on the econ growth links in the 84% austerity? And you were like, yeah, I literally asked no, that. No, you I was didn't. very confused. No, you didn't. You I, I asked that question did, after like, to, to us? <laughs> yes, after your speech, I asked you, is the only response to the Again, again, I, I, you said other things. things. He said yes. He's like, no, that and other things, like, and policy advice is important. No, he just said yes. And then also, so Ian asked here's, about here's the, the biggest problem. Here's, here's the biggest problem with the round. The fundamental okay. mistake you've made in this round is you haven't thought about the past, you've only thought about the future. Six million That's... people have died from austerity. We have had a shift away from social capitalism yeah, we, again, we... Oh, into neoliberalism. Even if you were going to make this argument that now they've done something better, obviously we've had... 40 years okay, of so negative then, growth, and negative then, policies. Then in final that focus, obviously gives us the way. And then in final focus, we just each have to argue about whether the past or future is good. I, I access all the weighing you read, like the time frame, all poverty because of safety net, magnitude right, policies. I it. access all that. As much yeah, fun as this has been, I think this is crawl. Yeah, I agree. All right, we have a minute left. Okay, so the order is gonna be sort of wonky. So it's gonna start on the DA's theory. And since there's like a whole, all this cross application with our austerity stuff, then we'll go to austerity and then we'll go back to neoliberalism. Okay. Let's start on the DA's they read in their last speech. A couple issues. First, the warrants have com are completely missing that last speech. Why does that decrease 90 percent? Why does spending increase 5 percent? It's five times. It's never made clear, so you don't evaluate these arguments. Second, the evidence is all written by the IMF, which they have conceded to some sense of rebuttal, is a horrible actor, and they're totally biased with the, on their own scholarship, which you don't prioritize their argument. Also, if you want to look at the uniqueness claim and the, the, the recency claims, or Oxfam evidence is the most recent evidence they run, and it says that 84 percent of loans in COVID have austerity, they call for belt tightening, and our Pete evidence is the only uniqueness claim evidence that said that you uniquely 5 million children a year are dying because of IMF austerity. So obviously it's a bad thing. Go to austerity. They have conceded that IMF loans have austerity and in COVID it's gotten worse, 84% have austerity. So, which is bad because the PETA evidence indicates that austerity cuts things like social spending and food aid, which means that people can't eat Wi-Fi, which is why 5 million children die a year. Two pieces conceded when A is a prereq analysis, the prereq SDR is because if they're arguing, it's because uh, the auction evidence indicates the reason that the current crisis is so bad is there aren't social safety nets in the developing world because of austerity. The second warrant is why it is bad is that it outweighs in severity and time frame we have an infinite impact of death pool. Their impact is a one-term blip in poverty, which everyone can get in and out of. That being said, go back to our case. 
these Lincolns do not in any way interact with their case. Here's why. Set our argument of economics, which is in time. The Iber evidence writes that before the rise of the IMF, the world was going towards, going towards social democracies, but the Mueller evidence says the IMF's role as a norm setter, scholarship author, and global advice fund to infect the world with neoliberal capitalism. That was damning to the global south. Our Sandberg evidence explains that social democracies focus on redistributive outcomes over the whims of multinational corporations, which is why social democracies empirically outperform neoliberalism in every economic metric, and the austere IMF created neoliberalism that kept billions of people in, in the global south in poverty. Their own framework from rebuttal is that whoever helps people in the global south the most wins. This is every single person in the global south, so the round is over. The Lincolns also don't link an egg as our organs retrospective, even if they are right that now the IMF is doing something good and putting people out of poverty. That's just people they pushed into poverty 60 years ago. It is on it a bad thing still, but also there's no warning as to why stability increases or why even why stability increasing actually leads to our argument. At the end of the day, it's just really simple. They do not understand our argument and they have conceded the GA and all their warrants are gone in the last speech. Thank you. Please vote pro. Con, dang it. All right, we'll take the last 17 seconds. Okay, um, the order is going to start on the SDR's argument, specifically on like weighing on the SDR's argument, and then go to their argument. Is everyone good? All right. This round is pretty simple. They've 100% conceded the short circuit that during COVID, social democracies fall in developing nations because there's no influx of money. This is just dropped in the first final focus. This means if we win a link into SDRs, we prereq their case. So if we win SDRs, we win the round. They give you one response. They just say that 84% of loans have austerity. One, their own 84% evidence indicates that the IMF is now prioritizing health expenditure, which is why the conceded A, Johnson evidence indicates that spending is five times higher after the IMF, and B, the conceded Gary evidence indicates that when you account for selection biases, the IMF actually increases health and education spending. This Gary evidence is not from the IMF. It proves Johnson even if it's from the IMF, the Gary evidence is conceded. It was in summary. We win the, this is said. Scion implies that we access their wing because when we increase social spending, this means that we're able to access into the infinite magnitude that they impact out to. So their weighing on this turn does not matter. At that point, you vote on SDRs because the argument is conceded. We say that the IMF has allocated $500 billion to, through COVID to special drawing rights. This is money that countries can use to cash into actual cash so that they can restructure their economies and facilitate vaccine recovery, which is empirically increased healthcare spending by 45% and mitigated the 08 crisis. We say that this is important because it's directly saving millions of people and lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. The short circuit's conceded, you vote on SDRs. Let's go to their case. We point out that if we win a link into economic growth, we link into neoliberalism because A, it independently creates more stability, allowing countries to create their own domestic growth and not rely on external actors, but B, structural economic benefits means that such policies aren't harmful, harmful. it's another link into their social spending. And guess what? They have conceded the infrastructure turn, which is a link into these Lincolns. We say that the IMF provides faulty advice into these countries so that they can invest into things like infrastructure, which is empirically created 33 million jobs and increased GDP by 2.7%. In response to the Neil analysis that they make, that we're taking people out of poverty that we push into, cross apply all their time frame at weighing, we access infinite magnitude via scope magnifies over time. We link into their case, they've conceded the short circuit on COVID, two places to vote for us. Good round, y'all. Good, Good round. round. And thank you all for judging.
we have a decision. All right, it looks like everyone that needs to have their cameras on does have their cameras on. So I will announce the decision. Um, fantastic round. Uh, with that said, the decision is a 2-1 decision for the con. Um, so congratulations to Newton Valley or Newton South. Um, I guess since I'm already talking, I will uh, say how I voted and explain uh, my vote. So I cast my ballot for Newton South on the con. Um, Really what my ballot came down to, well, first I'd like to say that I'm really glad Civil War was dropped because it was messy and frankly boring. Um, I think that the round coming down to the more ethereal economic policy arguments that it did made the round much more interesting. Um, and with that, I did cast my ballot uh, largely on the epistemic economics argument, the argument about just the clear links that were able to be drawn between uh, the IMF's policy and then the rise of neoliberalism and uh, the negative effects that the negative were able to uh, show from that. Also, um, the AF really never got over the austerity response made by the NEG to um, SDRs. So that sums up my decision. Again, congratulations. Um, I can go next. So I sat, I voted for um, the AF. Um, I actually had a hard time making this decision because I agree a lot with what uh, the previous judge said in terms of like who won what. I think my biggest thing was weighing this like short circuiting like COVID argument that was like really strongly emphasizing final focus. I wasn't really sure how much weight to give it because it was like a lot like more emphasizing final focus. But I do think that like um, the problem was that I see a lot of harm to happen in the past. But if I can give some sort of risk of solvency to the fact that COVID is going to make it infinitely better, I'm like, sure, fine. I'll like give you a benefit of the doubt. And insofar as they should so short circuit that wing, I end up giving them that argument. So that's why they win that. But I do agree that you all don't do. A, um, I agree with that on this like economic argument on the neg case that the app is severely behind. It's just because I gave them the risk of solvency that I end up giving that wing, which is why I give them that argument. But I think this was a really good round. Okay, cool. Um, so I evidently voted neg. And here's my reasoning. So the way I vote in any round is I start on what is the most important in terms of weighing. Um, this round was a bit weird, though, because no one really had weighing in terms of actual impact calculus. People just linked into each other and said, ah, oh, this is a prereq, ah, oh, this is a short circuit, right? And so I get this idea from the AF, for example, that during COVID, apparently you're not allowed to be a social democracy. So that short circuits the NEG case. I get this idea from the NEG um, that uh, like austerity and also neolib link into the AF crisis scenario because they were the causes of the crisis of the worsening of the crisis in the first place. So there's this narrative that we wouldn't have needed this solution if we didn't have these causes in the first place from the NEG. But at the end of the day, these are all just links into each other. No one actually tells me what impact I should vote on first. Um, so it's just a, a bit annoying in terms of that in like impact calculus. Um, obviously I am given some sort of like uh, time frame stuff, infinite magnitude, but I don't think there's any unique link into that as in I think that most of the links in this round link into that same weighing calculus, um, which I'm also not given a warrant wise like necessarily infinite. Plus I think that like within that there's probably bigger infinity. So I would have preferred any sort of comparison there. Um, one way I could vote uh, that leads me to the same decision I arrived to, but is probably um, marginally less, I don't know, satisfying for you is the only terminal impact extended in any speech, uh, like at, through any speech by final focuses is the impact of austerity killing like five or 6 million. I think the number changed um, throughout the round children. Um, so Technically, there's no other impact. So if I'm looking at impact calc purely, then I, I guess I would go there. Um, but I know you don't really want that. So let me actually walk through all of the line by line stuff. Um, I'd probably vote on austerity first. What, one of the reasons is that. The other reason is because there's conceded prereq weighing that I think is an actual prereq. Um, so there's two pieces of weighing on austerity. One of them is the whole like uh, magnitude stuff that links into bigger time frame than SDRs. 
which is probably true. Uh, there's not too much pushback in terms of the comparative of time frame. The pro just sort of asserts we link into the same time frame and magnitude wing. I'm not sure that's true. It may be more true on like the infrastructure link you go for, um, because that you know seemed more logical and intuitive to link into the like longer time frame analysis. Um, but I'm not sure it's the same on the um, SDRs argument. Uh, but regardless, and more importantly, there is one piece of weighing that is conceded on SDRs just fully through every speech, uh, which is the first piece of weighing that the SDRs, um, the austerity argument prerequisites SDRs because the COVID crisis only got this bad, according to the Oxfam evidence, because of a lack of social safety nets, which was caused by austerity, uh, which means that if I buy austerity, uh, then I buy that, you know, without austerity, this crisis wouldn't have needed SDRs to intervene, which prereqs the entire impact scenario that the app is going for. So there is pushback, there is ink on austerity. I think this ink is actually quite good. It is also dropped. Um, it is the idea that actually long-term, the IMF increases social spending, it increases health spending, et cetera. Um, the loans, the austerity is not a huge issue. There's like a five times increase in spending according to the Johnson card. Unfortunately, um, like the, the evidence extension on this question, specifically in, in the final focus is Gehring. Um, Gehring and Lang is from the IMF. I don't really care about that though, um, because more importantly, Neg is just right. There's no warrant. I don't know if ever, ever like a word was given, but there's certainly no warrant extended in summary, nor in final focus for any of the responses to austerity which are all like hinge upon this sort of asserted claim that spending actually increases. Like, I don't know why, like you just say it increases. So the actual warrant extension is quite nicely given by the NEG, which is that in order to like meet the requirements for a loan, the IMF forces them to go into austerity, which cuts their spending. That makes intuitive sense. That means that five or 6 million, however many children die, that has happened empirically. There's a decent probability on that. And insofar as the prereq analysis is conceded, then like I, that's probably the easiest place for me to vote because I don't think the ink on that is sufficient or warranted. Um, okay, so that's the first place I vote. If we didn't want to answer the austerity question though, uh, I still think that I vote neg because I think that importantly, um, so first on the question of like the timing of the speech, I was timing the speech, the link extension by my time was in time. I do think a lot of it was over time, but the part that was over time specifically was more so weighing and impact, um, like the billions of poverty. So I still think the link extension was on time. Regardless, there's also like a paradigmatic question of like, should I even evaluate this claim given that it wasn't in final focus? Like the sort of claim that it was over time sort of appeared to be dropped. Um, either way you could go about it, I still come back to the idea that I give Neg the link. Um, the only ink on this is sort of well pointed out by the neg as being independent. So it is an independent link from the F. Um, specifically, they collapse on infrastructure in final focus um, that links into similar impacts the neg is going for. I think the neg correctly points out that one, there's never an internal warrant in any speech for why like the nebulous idea of austerity or like, sorry, stability links into the same impact scenario of a neoliberal economic world order that the neg is going for. Like that seems to be just an assertion. Um, but also, they're also right that there is no warrant for any of these things that's extended. The same way that the Johnson card never had a warrant in summary or final focus. Um, summary didn't even mention the word infrastructure. It was just like IMF advice means 33 million more people get jobs. Um, final focus mentioned infrastructure again, but I, I still don't know the warrant for why they need IMF advice to get infrastructure, for example. Um, and more importantly, 33 million jobs, okay, maybe is an impact. I have no clue how to compare that to the also conceded link story and conceded impact story from the NEG case. Yes, the like billions of people in poverty was dropped in final focus and not in time and summary, but there is external weighing that I don't think is dependent on the impact from the NEG case. Uh, this is similar weighing to the austerity that retrospectively, all of the crises that the AF talks about a, would have been better solved by social democracies, which is conceded, and B, were caused predominantly by the institutions of neoliberalism, 
um, which also has its own little scope weighing that it affects everyone in the global south, which is another uh, conceded argument that is makes it very easy to vote on the neoliberalism scenario over the advantage and also over SDRs. Uh, even if, oh, the other thing is, even if SDRs is a, a short circuit to neoliberalism, um, one, again, I vote on austerity first, two, more importantly, I think that the short circuit is not warranted in final focus. It is just, you cannot be a social democracy if you have COVID. I don't know why. Um, third and more importantly, it's probably just a short-term short circuit. Like if I'm actually, it is not actually a short circuit. You can't just call it a short circuit and be like, ah, oh, that means a terminal defense. Because again, they're going for a retrospective weighing importantly. So the comparative that I get is this is just a link in that the burden is on the F to weigh against the neg link. But what I get is one world has social democracy up until COVID. If I buy your short circuit as true, then after COVID, you get neoliberalism. Whereas your world is just neoliberalism up until COVID and then more neoliberalism. So comparatively more neoliberalism is probably worse. And again, it doesn't actually answer the weighing that the NEG presents that has a sort of time frame distinction, uh, as in it's talking about the roots of the crises that the app is talking about in the first place. Uh, and so therefore probably comes first. That might be a bit intervention-y, but I also think that you need to have a warrant and the burden is on you to prove these weighing things. Um, and so, yeah, I vote on austerity, I vote on neoliberalism, even if, if, even if I don't vote on austerity. Okay, thank you so much. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank I'm you so much. incredibly sleep deprived, so I'm gonna go now, but thank yeah, you all for judging. Good luck y'all and now it's... Yeah, good luck. Thank you.